you're here. But tonight we're here to see First Reformed. The film is typical Schrader. There probably are two hallmarks to a Schrader film. One of those is a transcendental style that pushes you as viewer to mystery. And the other is a gritty realization of human depravity that pushes us toward meaninglessness. And it's that fine dance between meaninglessness and meaning, between despair and hope, that is a typical Schrader movie. you literally wrote the book on transcendental cinema um this sort of you know this kind of theological aesthetics you know which uh, as practiced by Bresson and Ozu and 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 Bergman and Tarkovsky um you you know that you understand this cinema so well and so instinctively but you had not until first reformed did you you know made a film in that style what gave you the impulse to finally do that after so many years in filmmaking well I never thought I would um uh, I had written about uh, spiritual contemplative films. I uh, didn't think I would ever make one. I was too intoxicated by the engines of empathy and action and sexuality and violence, which are not in the Transcendental Toolkit. <laughs> and uh, you know, when people tried to compare films I'd been involved in with, the, with that book I'd written, I said, no, 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 that's not me. That's not me. You're mistaken. And then I had a, a situation about three years ago where I was having dinner with Pavel Pavlovsky and I'd just given him an award for Ida. I was walking uptown and I said to myself, you know, it's time. You know, you're going to be 70 next year. You've always said that you would never, ever make one of these films. Well, it's now time to make one. <laughs> and so I started writing it. And oddly enough, right around the same time, I was invited to a panel at the SCMS Society for Cinema and Media Studies annual convention, and they were doing a, um, a panel called Rethinking Transcendental Style, which scholars from Israel, Spain, and uh, Baylor um, were giving papers uh, reflecting and reevaluating that book I had written 45 years ago. And I thought to myself, well, if anybody's going to be rethinking transcendental style, it should be me. <laughs> so I, I said then about rethinking it and spent uh, three years writing the longest essay, which is now going to be included in the new version of the book coming out from UCAL Press in May. So coincidentally, I found myself going back to the place I started from, because I'd written that book before uh, becoming a screenwriter, and also in a way going back to the place I started from as a screenwriter because there's so much of Taxi Driver in this. And so it, it, to me, it's, it rounds out the circle rather nicely. What's, you know, you're, you were, we were talking about this earlier, just, you know, you're, you know, loving this kind of transcendental and loving, you know, boring cinema, transcendently boring <laughs> movies, which I think we all can kind of relate to. But what, what, what are kind of, I guess, just the spiritual underpinnings of that? Something with how, how they play with your sense of time um, and, and, and how they uh, both elongate your perspective on time and how most you know, we, we can say Hollywood cinema or whatever, um, really tries to collapse time. So it takes the two hours and you go in, you come out and you're like, whoa, that was five minutes. And, and what this does, it doesn't just expand time, but it actually asks you to kind of live into it, to participate in time in that way, um, which is really a, a sort of devotional, sort of religious approach to time at all, um, but especially to to specific spaces, to unique spaces, whether that be the cinema or other arts, or even, as we were talking at, at dinner, um, our, our own sort of worship um, is this sense in which we're getting together 
to learn how to waste time um, in, a, in a deeply, profoundly sincere way. And so for me, that's part of why I like boring movies. <laughs> well, <laughs> and you was, know, yeah. good things happening. Good things happen while you wait. Exactly. Yeah, and and to be trained and cultivated in in a in, in a sensibility that allows for boredom to be constructive, and not simply a sort of pejorative kind of sensibility. I think is is healthy. It's good, and it I think it taps in really to um, what's deeply spiritual about all of us. And you know, speaking only for myself. I don't think there's a boring minute in this movie. You know, you compare this to a film by, say, Pedro Costa or Lisandro Alonso or some of the, the slowest cinema artists of our current generation. Um, you have a ton of empathy and action in this film. Uh, so you're, you're kind of, you're, you're, I, are you sort of calibrating, you know, how much to sort of challenge the audience while telling? Is it just the, the storyteller in you that naturally? Yeah, I mean, this is that dance. You know, when you come to <coughs> withholding uh, techniques. Uh, there's probably about 10 or so of them. And then you look at different slow, slow directors and they all eat from the same buffet, but they eat in different portions. And so no two alike. And, you know, there are those directors who work in the commercial cinema, that is, they make movies for audiences. And those are directors who lie beyond the Tarkovsky circle who work for museums and they work for academics. And so I, I still consider myself within that slowed down cinema, but still uh, a commercially driven cinema, yes. you know, for audiences, not, not, you know, the large audiences, but really for audiences. And uh, I, in fact, thought this film would, would be more boring than it is. <laughs> in the technical sense, right? Yeah, no, I mean, I, 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 that was part of the intent. You know, slow it down, slow it down. And uh, when I first started screening the film, I was very surprised that I didn't detect this kind of uh, boredom effect yeah. that I wanted. Uh, and I elongated some things, you know, but that's that dance that you do when you're involved with withholding techniques. You know, if you withhold from the viewer, um, they have, at some point, you, you keep saying, no, 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 no. I'm not going to give you what you want. And at some point, they do one of two things. They either say, okay, we'll come toward you, and that's what is the magic of the arts. Or they say, no, I'm sorry, we're going home. And... Um, and so you're trying to, you know, ride that line. Would this film have been better if it were three minutes longer? I'm not sure. Would it have been better if it was three minutes shorter? Probably not. No, definitely not. So, um, you know, but, but that's that dance. Contemplative quality, but I think the movie is so driven by this core of anger that you feel in every moment, this palpable anger that you seem to have tapped into. And I'm, I'm just curious. I think there are a lot of um, things that, you know, a, a person, a believer, a non-believer can relate to in terms of just things to make one angry in this film. How, of all of those, especially in our hideous political climate at the moment, how did you decide on climate change? For sort of the history of our race, the philosophy has always been talking, what is our purpose here, the eschatological meaning of our lives? And this, to a large degree, has been a theoretical conversation. Now we're sitting in the first place one of the first moments in history where this is not such a theoretical conversation, where if you get on your tippy toes, you can see the end of this either phase of evolution or this um, uh, of human species. And um, the, you, the, the planet's not in trouble. The planet's going to be just fine. As soon as we're gone, take 50,000 years, it'll be right back, and, and, and then it won't, be, it won't have us anymore. So, you know, does this really, you know, make the argument? And, and it is, one of the things I found interesting is, does this guy, Reverend Toller, really care about the environment at all. I mean, he is, he's sick. 
he has what Kierkegaard calls the sickness unto death, angst. And he's trying to do something about it. He's writing a journal. He's doing the liturgy of the church. He's uh, performing the rites of the church. He's drinking anything. He's praying or trying to pray. It doesn't work. And then he meets this kid, and this, he catches the virus. All of a sudden, all his suffering now has a context. Now, is he dying because he's an ecological warrior? Or is he dying because that is the pathology of a certain form of Christianity? Cutter, what are your thoughts? <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes. Uh, uh, yeah, you know, I... I read it in a couple of ways. One, and, and what I, th I think, so correct me if I'm wrong here, but sort of the ending stops us cold. I mean, no one was breathing in this room. Oh, <laughs> and uh, then you, it sort of sheds light back on everything else we just watched, including this notion of sort of ecological crisis. Um, so I saw it sort of as, a, um, as one of numerous different traumas under which we are suffering. Um, so we have the trauma of the, the, the uh, ecological body, if you will, the trauma that we're seeing in the, uh, the corporate body of the church, um, the trauma of this man's body, um, and this weird sense where you've got, you know, humans are sort of the, the Drano <laughs> of the earth, right? That, that in a sense we're necessary, but it, poisoning it um, in this weird way, in, in part because we've, we've um, uh, sort of overreached in, in, in that sense. I saw that as sort of the tableau against which this sort of character study played out. And he's, he's got this sickness, this pathological, um, basically, I'm going to die. Uh, the question isn't if, it's when and how, right? Um, and, and so he gets to this, this point where he, yeah, like, mean, it, even yeah. the, the very first time of the premise, I'm going to write this journal yeah. for a year. Yeah. Meaning, you know, I, I'm giving myself a year to live simply by writing this journal. Yeah. And I, and I thought this is a fascinating character study of the sort of religious imagination, because on the one hand we have in our tradition and our narratives, well, a Messiah complex, that somehow it's it's our job to save the earth. It's our job to 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 fix it, right? Um, and so you get to this this final climax, and again you have this man who's saying um, one option is I'm going to blow up everybody. You know this great act of of terror. <laughs> um, and when he realizes I can't do that because the woman's there, well I'm going to go out with sort of dignity, right? This sort of self-aggrandizing um, suicide. Um, that all gets stopped. That's your sort of stasis point where um, his, all of his plans, all of his, you know, machinations kind of end on the recognition that, um, oh, I'm more profoundly sick than I even realized. And my solutions, my answers aren't actually going to, to, to be the solution. Um, and it's this woman, Mary, um, <laughs> and her little seed of of potentiality that dares against all of the other sort of terror and trauma to suggest maybe there's there's another way. Um, so I don't know if that's appropriate interpretation of what you're doing. It's very designed that way. It's also designed the other way. Hmm. Um, how does she get there? Yeah. Why is the room suddenly glowing? Why is it in slow motion? Where is the sound effect? Maybe this is post-mortem. Maybe he's having an ecstatic vision. Maybe the last thing he sees as he throws his insides out on the floor is her, her angelic presence. And a friend of mine said to me, he said that uh, he interpreted it as, you know, the sudden presence of grace in a, on, a, on a lost life. But... Um, I know I don't know whether he's alive or dead, and uh, and I, I designed it so I wouldn't know. So one one thing that I kept having in my mind at the end is the end of Raging Bull, and you kind of name it there. I once was blind, yeah. but now I see. W do you give us that liberty of interpretation? In well, this that film? that particular quote was added by Scorsese because he oh, yeah, no. because he had almost he had almost died in the hospital in Rome, oh. um, and 
And so, but if you go back another film, The Taxi Driver, mm -hmm. you have this sense of, is Travis alive anymore? Mm -hmm. This whole kind of happy ending, <laughs> you know? Um, and, uh, you know, that kind of ambiguity certainly gives something, you know, shelf life. And, uh, and uh, those are the kind of films I sort of like. Which you sort of reinforce to the ambiguity of the sudden burst of camera movement, this 360 degree pan in a film where there has scarcely been a camera movement until that moment, right? It's uh, yeah, all of a sudden, you know, uh, you've taken the leap, you've jumped outside of this this physical sphere, and I I, I foreshadowed that by having that Tarkovsky levitation scene. I'd say, you know. We're gonna we're gonna leave this this physical world, you know. And, and here's a sort of foreshadowing that that that's gonna happen. Uh, and uh, but it's an interesting story. I, I don't know how familiar this audience is with uh, spiritual religious films, but uh, when I wrote the script, I gave it to uh, Kent Jones, who runs the New York Film Festival, is an old friend. And I said, you know, what do you think of this kit? And uh, and at that time, it ended with him on his knees, disgorging himself, and the camera resting on the crucifix, which is the same ending as Diary of a Country Priest. And Ken said, you know, it's interesting because I thought you were going to go to the Ordet ending, and you went to the Country Priest ending. Mm -hmm. And as soon as he said that, I thought, oh, man, that's right. That's right. Because now Ordet, a, a film by Carl Dreyer, meaning the word, is about a miracle. The, the, this man's wife dies, and his crazy brother who thinks he's Jesus Christ, uh, who has been lost, and the, he wanders into the, the funeral and raises her from the dead. And there's a miracle, and she's alive. And his only reaction to having his wife alive again is not, oh, my God, I witnessed a miracle, is carnal lust. <laughs> She's back. I have her again physically. I can hold her. I can kiss her. I can caress her. And so that's what Kit was talking about. And I said, as soon as he said that, I said, yes, that's where we have to go. We have to go to a moment of complete carnality. Yeah. So as you say that then, um, so the, the, the sort of surrealistic moment where they're laying on top of each other um, is in the real world, and like it still proceeds, but both, I'm, I'm now just rethinking, um, does he really touch anybody at all the rest of the film other than those two moments? Because it's interesting that these are potentially surreal, uh, imaginative escapes, maybe a last sort of blip of the consciousness at death, but at the same time, they're the most physically tangible moments in his... Yeah, existence. no, he, he touches no one. Yeah. Ethan Hawke, I think, gives... He's such a terrific actor, and I think he gives such a brilliant performance in this movie. Uh, not someone who necessarily leaps to mind when you think of a clergyman, but in fact, as we were talking about, he does have a background in, in this. He was, in fact, I believe his... Some family member wanted him to be a priest at one point. You're talking. Did well, you know, yeah, yeah. No, I mean, um, he has been to Gethsemane, which is the Thomas Merton place in Kentucky. His, his former father-in-law is a very important figure in Eastern religion. So he knows this world. Plus, he has that kind of physiognomy that le leads one to identify with a suffering person, very much like Montgomery Cliff in the I Confess movie or the country priest. And uh, whereas if you look at a different movie, uh, Calvary starring Brendan Gleeson, and where you have this kind of corpulent, corpulent uh, priest who's suffering, you know, you don't really think he's suffering because he doesn't look suffering. So uh, Ethan had that, and, uh, <clears throat> and he was just the right age now. You know, the boyishness is gone. Uh, he's getting some very interesting lines in his face. And, uh, yeah, he just felt right. That's what I hope people say about me as I age. You have some very interesting lines in your face. I'm curious about just the writing process. We've touched on this, but like, you know, the, the framework is Taxi Driver, but 
you you know you incorporate elements of, of Dreyer and and of and and of Bergman and is it just was it kind of just like putting this puzzle together of various obs- cinephilic obsessions of yours and uh, well I mean the secret of stealing is that you have to steal around you <laughs> you can't keep going back to the same Seven Eleven they will catch you <laughs> so you go over here you go over there you go over there you grab a little something from a whole bunch of people and you put it together and people think it's yours. Um, Artists have done that from the beginning of time. That's what we do. So I, I, when I thought, I said, I'm going to write one of these films, I thought about the films that meant most to me, and I started running through them and what I liked about them. And, um, and literally, I, I, had, I was writing, and at one point I said, you know, I think I should foreshadow some kind of non-material world. And... And I said, not thinking. I said, well, well, what would Tarkovsky do? Said, well, Tarkovsky would have them levitate. You know, that was his go-to position. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so I said, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll have them levitate. But of course, then I did it in a fashion where the Edenic dream turns into a, a Bashian, a hellish dream. And uh, but what I wasn't quite so aware of when I was writing and directing was the degree to which there was a taxi driver. And the, I didn't wasn't really aware until the editor said to me one day in the editing room, you know, this movie is full of taxi driver. I said, yeah, well, I know, I know there's some in there. He said, no, no, there's a lot in there. And I just really hadn't been that aware of it, but now I am. Hmm. What you're describing, even stealing around a sort of tradition uh, is very Jesus-y. <laughs> uh, and, and the sort of setting of a trap at the end is very, very much a sort of modern day parable of here's the tradition you've been handed. And now let me set this trap for you that involves you, that makes you complicit, that uh, problematizes what your sort of received um, assumptions and presuppositions, but requires work on your part too. You can't just come in here willy nilly you have to actually invest your time. Do you think that, say, uh, Ida, um, the film you saw, or this one, do these films exist if the content isn't religious? Well, you have hit on a core contradiction Mm. in what I'm talking about. Okay, theoretically, you are talking about a style, Mm -hmm. not content. Mm -hmm. If the style works, it works. Mm -hmm. It works whether it's a liturgy or a Zen garden. It, it, the style works. However, it seems to work better <laughs> if the subject matter is also religious. So there's a film by Carlos Regados called Silent Light about the Mennonites in Mexico. A film called uh, Stations of the Cross by Dudrich Brueggemann uh, about uh, uh, Christian conservatives in Germany. And you start going through these films, Lords by Jessica Hauser. And uh, and they're all sort of feeding off from the subject matter. And so the critic in you says, yes, theoretically this works purely on style, but it's a lot easier when you have this subject matter. I mean, but theoretically this should work if this was the story of a plumber, you know, who... Um, uh, who had lost faith with the plumbing business. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> and decides to wrap himself in barbed wire at the end, you know. <laughs> I know we've already talked about the ending. I have a kind of a prosaic question. I love um, leaning on the everlasting arms. It took me back to Lillian Gish singing it, uh, Night of the Hunter. Um, was that, um, was, I'm not asking if that was a reference, but what, what, what's... No, the, what, it wasn't a reference. The, yeah. It was, yeah. It's George Beverly Shea. Uh, it's Billy Graham and, you know, my father with the George Beverly Shea LPs at home, you know, hearing them, he had a very limited taste in religious music and it, mostly with George Beverly Shea. So, uh, so when I started thinking about this, I started hearing that. And also, you know, so the other songs, you know, you have this whole issue of, uh, of, Blood being in the Christian DNA, it's beginning with Old Testament sacrifice and the sacrifice of of Christ and transubstantiation and on and on. And in in this film, they're singing, "I'm washed in the blood." 
And Ethan sits there in the church, just sitting there listening. And you just sense this sort of extraordinary feeling coming from him. He's listening to these lyrics. And finally, he closes his eyes. And, um, you know, I was raised with those songs. There is a fount that flows from Emmanuel's veins. And so it's not entirely surprising when a, a person, usually a man, goes off the rails and they start going off in this sacrificial way, although some very famous female saints have done so also. also. But, you know, this notion of flagellation, and, yeah. uh, you know, you know, if I suffer enough, I will be worthy. Well, that is a kind of virus that is in the Christian DNA that is not unlike jihadism. I think that leaves us with a lot we'll leave on that <laughs> note to think about. Um, Paul Schrader, thank you so much for being here with us. Thank you for this brilliant film, which will be opening in June. Please encourage everyone to go see it. And, and thank you again, Justin and Paul, um, for coming and joining us. Thank you all. Thank you.